Welcome to Westside Community Church. You're joining us for a message series entitled Down But Not Out by Pastor John Clark. This is part five. If you got your Bibles, take them and turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 35. This is part five of Down But Not Out. And, um, and this morning I want to I just kind of give you a little background to where we've been if you've not been with us. And then, and then I'm going to jump into the last verse and really show you something I believe will change your life. So Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 35. I'm just going to hum through the first part to make sure you're all caught up. Verse 30 of Luke chapter 10 says this, A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him. Can you imagine? They took his clothes off. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. We talked about the fact that this is geographical, right? If you know the region there, from Jerusalem to Jericho drops 3,400 feet in elevation. It is geographical. It's physical. Going from Jerusalem to Jericho is physically going down. But we've been talking about what it's like to go down emotionally and spiritually, financially, personally. What it's like to be going down before you fall down. And there's a difference. You can see somebody going down, and, 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 and they're different than when they're falling down. You can come upon somebody who just slipped in a parking lot, and as you watch them go down, you know how they fell. You could tell it was the elbow they got hurt. But if you come upon somebody falling in a parking lot, and you didn't see them going down, you don't know what hurts, do you? You don't know what they bumped. You don't know what they bruised. And so it's different finding somebody going down than it is somebody who's fallen down. And we've been talking about how how emotionally some of you have gone through depression. This has been a tough winter, a, a tough season for us, and, and it doesn't seem like it's going to end. And, and, and with a lack of sunshine, depression seems to run uh, supreme this time of year. And so you're going down emotionally. You're, you're depressed, and, and you might have even probably fallen down. You need to get back up. Some of you financially have gone down. This was a terrible 2013 and 14 isn't looking much better. You, you've been going down paycheck to paycheck doesn't answer what it's like to be in your house, right? Going down. No, we've been falling down. Somebody here today is just recently divorced. You've been going down emotionally. You can't even sleep at night because tears fill your eyes. You've been going down. You understand what I'm talking about, right? Going down before you fall down. And we talked about that. I, I said to you a few weeks ago, it bothered me when I read this scripture and I discovered that the man was stripped of his clothes first. Who in their right mind as a robber takes a man's clothes off? Isn't the goal to get money? But they stripped him of his clothes and we discovered the reason why they did that is they were taking from him his righteousness. As a Jewish man, the cloak he wore was symbolic of Genesis chapter 3, the covering that God made for Adam and Eve after their sin. And when they stripped it from his body, they were saying to him, God is no longer near you. That's a lie from the pits of hell. God is always with you, and he'll always be with you. And, and, and they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him. And they abandoned him. They went away, and they left him half dead. Is it bad enough to be half dead, or is it bad to be half alive? I don't know which is worse. Is it 50-50, or does it depend on the day? For some of you this morning, you have been stripped. You've been stripped of your integrity. You've been stripped of your honor. You've been stripped of your character. Some of you today, you've been beaten. You've been, you've been beaten by the odds, beaten by the system, beaten by, by, by relationships. For some of you, you've been abandoned. You feel all alone. Half dead doesn't explain it, right? We, we got broken promises, broken dreams, broken plans. But listen, all that can change. All that can change because Jesus is with us. I want to talk about that today. Verse 31 and 32 says that a, that a priest happened to be going down the same road. And, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. I'm not happy when I read that. He passed by on the other side. That's my brother in the Lord. We're, we're, we're priests. We're pastors. You, you help someone when they're down. That's our call. We're not plumbers. We're not electricians. We're priests. It says he passed by on the other side. It says, so to a Levite, when he came to the place... And saw the man, you, you get it? They saw him, they saw the man, he passed by on the other side. I was bothered by that, and I said to you, hey, 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 hang on, be easy on the priest, right? Because in, in, in Leviticus, it tells us that the priest has the right by God to pass by anybody who's dead. If you're all dead, a priest doesn't have to touch you because he can become ceremonially unclean and dead himself. But this man's only half dead, but the priest didn't know it. And, and I gave the priest a pass because I said, hey, hang on. What, what, what if the man's faking and he's actually a criminal? And the priest goes up to care about him and the guy jumps up and, and then he is robbed, the priest. Maybe he was in a hurry, right? Maybe, maybe he had a destination. Maybe he had to get somewhere. And so, 
So I looked at it and I said, I said, maybe there's a reason why. Maybe the priest himself is going down emotionally the same road. Maybe the priest is going down spiritually the same road. Maybe he's no different than the man who's already down. He's just going down. I, I think sometimes we put expectations on people because of their positions, and we forget that they're people too. He passed by. I, I, I've, I've talked to you over the last four weeks that, 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 that I don't believe the worst part of it is, is when you slip and you start going down. I don't know if that's the worst, and I, I don't even think it's the worst if you've fallen. To be honest, I don't think those two things are the worst part about it, going down or being fallen. Do you know what I think the worst part is? Is when somebody passes you by. When somebody's in a position to help you. When somebody's in a position to bless your life. When somebody's in a position to just lend you a hand and they pass you by. Hey, can I remind you, the Bible says the man's half dead. He's not all dead. I gotta believe he can still hear. I gotta believe the man who has fallen and has been stripped naked can still see. How hard is it to watch not one, but two people walk right past you Remember, I, I've explained to you that the, that the gorge where they're walking through is, is at the narrowest three feet wide and as wide as ten feet wide. When the Bible says he passed by on the other side, can, can, I, help you with some, can I help you with some distances? It ain't that far away, ten feet is, that the priest could clearly see the man who had fallen. It didn't like he, he, he didn't see him. He saw him, the Bible says. I gotta imagine the man who has fallen can hear his footsteps as he nears the corner where he's fallen under the hands of robbers. And, and, and there must be a, the heartbeat that is almost half gone. It begins to rise in, in, in repetition because somebody's coming. But, but as the footsteps near him, he, he hears them come to a slow stop. He knows now somebody is clearly gonna lend me a hand. Somebody's gonna clearly help me out. And then to his dismay and his surprise, the footsteps pick up again. And as quickly as they arrived at his location, they have now left his location. It doesn't happen but once, but it happens twice. I wonder if you've ever been in a situation where you've desperately needed someone, someone who was capable, someone who you had expectations to help you out, but they passed you by. I believe that may be the worst, the worst part about going down and falling down is having somebody pass you by. But let's talk about verse 33. It says, but a Samaritan came a Samaritan, as he traveled, excuse me, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he, he did what? He took pity on him. It goes on, verse 34 says uh, that, 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 um, that, that he went to him, he bandaged his wounds, he poured on oil and wine, and he put him on his own donkey. And then he took him to an inn, and there he took care of him. It's an amazing story. It's the good Samaritan story, right? You knew I was going to get to this. Let me talk to you about the Samaritan because this man intrigues me. He's not a priest. He's not a Levite of the family of priests. He's just a Samaritan. He's from this area. But, but let's look at verse 33. It says, the Samaritan, as he traveled... He traveled. That means he was going somewhere, okay? It ain't like he was bored. It ain't like this was his normal routine, like he just kept walking this stretch of road looking for people who'd been, who'd been mugged and, and, and robbed. He was traveling somewhere. It said as he traveled, he's got a plan. He's got an agenda. He's got to be somewhere. Somebody's expecting him. He's got a timeline. But, but it says that, that when he came to where the man was, it says, and he saw him. You see, he saw him, right? He, he could see him like the priest did. It said he took pity on him. Do you know the word pity in the original Greek? Literally means compassion. But there's an emphasis in the Greek on the last, uh, 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 emphasis is on the last letters of the word pity in the Greek, meaning not only compassion, but it means having compassion to where it hurts even to the bone. Meaning that, that, that when the Samaritan saw the man who, who, was, who was already laying down, he is naked, he is bleeding, he has been beaten, and he's half dead. The Bible says that his compassion level made his bones ache, meaning that he could not but do something. I wonder what it was, right? I wonder what caused this Samaritan to respond, but not the priest and not the Levite. And, and as I began to look at it, I thought, well, maybe it's the case where he said to himself, what if that was me? What if I've been in this condition? Wouldn't I want someone to help me? Isn't that just common Human courtesy. I wonder if he thought to himself like a father thinks, right? If that was one of my boys, if that's my daughter, 
I'd want someone to stop and help him out. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe that's why it hurt to the bone. And then, and then, then, I, then I read the line before, remember? The Bible says, when he came to where the man was, there is something intimate about coming to the place where someone is and you identify with it. Are you tracking with me yet? Is it not possible that this Samaritan has at one point in his life also gone down and fallen down and being himself stripped and beaten and abandoned and half dead? And when he saw the man laying there, he could not pass him by because he remembered that was me one time. I've been right where this guy's at. I cannot pass him by. Can I say to you just as a side note for a second and then I'll continue on. I have a feeling some of you have had one of the worst days of your life. It was when, you, it was when the divorce was finalized. I think somebody in this room's had one of the worst days of your life. It's when, it's when your house was taken from you. You lost it. You were evicted in foreclosure. Somebody's had one of the worst days of your life. Someone you loved very much was taken from you. They died. I, I believe somebody here has had a moment where your business had, had failed and you've never had a worse day in your life. I, I believe there's somebody here this morning that, that spiritually you know you crossed the line. That affair was too far. It hurt more than your relationship. It hurt you spiritually. There's somebody here this morning that, that you've got an anger problem. You've got an addiction issue that, that you solved, that, that God delivered you from. But you made it up, but that was one of the worst days of your life in detox. Somebody here, you survived cancer. You made it out you're a survivor praise God for that and, and you made it was one of the worst times of your life but if you're still with us if you're still here this morning then I got a little question for you when's the last cancer survivor you talked to when's the last person going through divorce you came along and you came to where they were where's the last person who lost their home that you heard about you walked up to and said I know exactly where you are because I have been where you are do you get it you get it? If you survived it, it's because Jesus wants you to do the ministry. There's got to be more of us in humanity and in this culture who see people who are going down and people who have fallen down and we say, I cannot walk past this one. I've got to stop. If you're a survivor and you're still with us, you better be looking for other travelers who have come under the same guise that you faced. And if you made it out alive, do you realize what you have to offer? Do you realize your experience? Do you realize, do, you realize, do you realize the lessons you have to teach? Wouldn't it have been amazing if someone would have come up to you and said, listen, this will only last for about 72 hours. The pain will go away. The tears will take a week or two, but they'll dry up. The anger you have will last for a month, but you'll get through it. Imagine what it would be like to come to where someone is. You understand that's your ministry, right? That's your ministry. Maybe the only thing you needed to hear today was you got a ministry. Some of y'all want to be a preacher. Some of you want to be a missionary. And you, you want to rise to these, these levels. And you think that's where I'll be used by God the most. Is it not possible you'll be used by God in your office? And that's your ministry field. Is it possible God wants to use you and your family to turn around and help other people who have been diagnosed with terrible diseases and encourage them? Is it possible that Jesus wants you to help somebody in this church today sitting in your aisle? When we get to the close of the service, he'll convict you and he'll show you the Holy Spirit will speak and say, say some words of kindness to them because they are right where you used to be. Mm, I love how God sets us up. You ought to applaud Jesus for that. It says in the Bible, it says he came to where the man was. And, and I like the ebonics of that. He says that he came to where the man was. I, I wonder if you, if you understand that, that it's a picture of Jesus. The Samaritan is a beautiful picture of Jesus that he comes to where we was, right? He comes to where we were. I, I love that in that, that picture because you understand that, that Jesus came to where people were. He, he went out of his way to make it. Remember last week we talked in John chapter 4, the woman at the well. She's coming to draw water at noon and hottest part of the day. She's outside the city gates at a, at a well reserved for animals and that's where she's drawing water. What's the Bible say? Jesus had to go through Samaria. Samaria. He got to the little town of Sychar and he sat by the well and he waited. He got to where this woman was. He came to where she was because she needed Jesus. I love that about my Savior. Bartimaeus laid on a roadside between Jerusalem and Jericho, the same road, blind, he cannot see, and he's begging for a living, and he hears the murmuring of the crowd, and he says, who is it? And somebody else says, it's Jesus of Nazareth. 
And what does the Bible say? Bartimaeus shouted all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He knew this was his moment, but guess what? Jesus knew it was his moment too. Jesus came to where the man was. He was there. He called Bartimaeus. His sight was restored. I love it that Jesus comes to where we was. I love it that, that he's there. The woman who, who had a bleeding disorder for 18 years, she sneaks to the crowd when she hears Jesus is in her neighborhood in Bethany. She reaches out and touches the hem of his garment, and instantly the blood disorder stops. It's amazing. She thought she got lucky that day, but I'm telling you what, Jesus came to where she was. He got there because she needed it. Absolutely, praise God. I'm not done. I'm not done. I, I, I think this would be true. I love the thief on the cross. He's hanging there because of his sins. And I believe Jesus came to where he was. Jesus was hanging on the cross beside him. Maybe the only reason why Jesus died on that day, other than for the sins of humanity, other than that, I believe that Jesus died on the cross that day because that thief was there. Jesus came to where we was. He's going to get to where you are. You're here this morning. He's already been here waiting for you. He's right here. Listen, the answer to your problems is Jesus. It's always been Jesus, and it'll always be Jesus. I'm getting fired up. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. <laughs> Bible says, I better move on. Bible says in verse 34, it says in verse 34 that, that he went to him and he bandaged his wounds. I, I, I love this story. I love, I love the picture of this. It says that, that, that he went to him. I mean, when he saw him in his compassion, he, he got to where the man was and, 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 and pity had taken over his compassion at the bones. It says that he, that he went to him and, and he bandaged his wounds. You understand that this is the first century, right? There are no first aid kits, all right? It's the first century. It isn't like he's got a little first aid kit with a, with a red cross on the top of the box hanging off his donkey. He can grab it and bring it over to this man, pop it open and do something. When he says he bandaged him, I'm telling you right now, he had to tear something that was his own because the clothes that were ripped from the man, I don't believe were clean enough to be used. But the Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he went to him, he bandaged his wounds. Uh, you, know, you know what they wore back then, right? I've talked to you about, about the three layers of clothing and the outer layer being a wool garment. He couldn't use that to bandage the man's wound. It was too rough, and he would have to remove, the Samaritan would have to remove his, his outer cloak made of wool, lay it upon his donkey's back, and then this one-piece garment called a tunic, basically a sleeveless T-shirt, that his mother or his wife had made for him. He was wearing this one piece of fabric. I believe he had to tear that. Something made in love for him, he would have to sacrifice for someone else. You know, it's of interest that this man is a Samaritan, and the man lying down, we believe, is a Jew. John chapter 4 says Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. These are mortal enemies. They don't like each other. They're not the same kin. They're not the same kind. And, and so, so when I read it, I don't see anywhere where he pre-qualified the man. I don't see anywhere where he had him fill out, a, fill out a, an application for whether or not I'm going to care about you. He went right to him. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds. He didn't say, hey, when you get your act together, I'm going to come help you. He didn't do that. He didn't say, hey, when you stop bleeding so bad, I'm going to bandage your wounds. He didn't do that. He didn't say, hey, when you can stand on your own two feet, then I'll come and help you. He didn't. He went to him and he bandaged his wounds. Do you know what it's like? Do you know what it's like to help someone out? You don't know. And they got blood and stuff everywhere. And you're getting your hands in there. You got to have a special kind of love. You got to, you got to have some sort of compassion to get invested in that. I, I don't know. For me, I'm, I'm thinking this man that was down, uh, there was no way he was going to get up. And there was no way he was going to get out of there unless he got a little help. I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't know if you've ever been to a place in your life where, where you weren't going to get out of what you got yourself into if you didn't get a little bit of help, right? I mean, I mean, I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how many friends you have. I don't care what kind of house you live in. I don't care what kind of car you drive. It don't matter how much money you got in the bank. When you have fallen down and you have no way to get up, none of those things really matter, do they? They don't matter. All that matters is you got a little help from someone. That's what you really needed. I was 17 years old coming home from basketball practice. It was about this time of year, wintertime, more than, more than 30 years ago. Uh, and, and, and as I'm coming home, I'm like any teenage boy. All I'm wearing is a pair of sweaty shorts and a sweaty t-shirt and my tennis shoes. Didn't have a jacket, didn't think I needed it. It's only wintertime, right? Driving home, and I got, a, I got a 1970 Chevelle. Jesus made a car that was so cool, he gave it to me. 
And a 70 Chevelle had a 350 with 400 horsepower. You shouldn't give that to a 17 year old in the winter time with rear wheel drive with bald slicks on the back, but I didn't care. And so when I come off Cedar Run Road onto Cedar Valley Road, I goosed it. If you don't know what goose means, it means you want to bring the rear end around a little bit, but you want to do it in a controlled way. Well, when I goosed it that day, apparently I got the gander too. Because when I goosed it, it swung me around real quick and slammed right into a snowbank. And I mean, when I say I got slammed into a snowbank, I got like plugged into the snowbank, okay? My cool car was now into the snowbank. And, the, and it's on the driver's side and all the snow is packed around, the windshield's covered. I'm like, stink! You know, because like, what am I going to do now? And then I remember my brother said, just rock it, right? So I threw it in reverse. Boom. Didn't move, by the way. It just went boom. Put it in drive. Boom, 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 boom. I'm doing this back and forth. And the motor sounds cool because it's stuck in the, in the snow bank, so it kind of muffles weird and kind of comes as a different sound. And it's like, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I'm doing this. I tried everything. And by the way, kids, listen closely. Come in close. Listen, listen, listen. This is before days of cell phones, okay? <laughs> so I can't call no one, okay? There's no one to call. I can't Instagram a pic of my moronic thing. <laughs> I can't tweet, just hanging out. <laughs> I'm stuck where I'm at, right? And so I'm there, and I don't know if I prayed. I really don't know. I'd like to say to you, I just asked, dear Jesus, send me an angel. I don't know that I prayed. I don't know, but I slid across the, the seat, and I got out of the passenger door, and I closed it, and now I'm freezing to death. I'm standing out there in shorts and t-shirt, and they're all wet, and I'm like, I ain't as cool as I thought, but I'm cold, and I'm watching it, and all of a sudden, this truck pulls up, and just comes right in. It was like, Oh, this is so cool. But out got the creepiest guy I've ever seen in my life, okay? <laughs> now, I don't think I'm abducting material, okay? I don't think I'm the, I don't think that I was the kind of person he wanted to abduct, but he scared me for a moment. And he got out of the vehicle and he had like this grizzly beard and he had a cement block for a head. I'm not kidding. Flat top with a flat jaw with this grizzly beard and gruff, real gruff. And he gets out and he goes, What'd you get yourself into there, boy? <laughs> not what I was expecting from Jesus' angel, but. So the first thing I said, I, it just came to me. I said, well, a deer ran across in front of me, and so I had to break him. <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> said, well, I don't see no deer tracks. Looks like you were screwing around. <laughs> and he got back in his truck and started backing away. I'm like, no! <laughs> Jesus sends help, and I lie to it, OK? <laughs> the Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. It just found me out. I need this man, but actually he wasn't leaving. He backed around, he turned around, and he backed up next to my car, and he jumped out of the vehicle. And check this out. There was a day when there was vehicles with real bumpers, okay? And he wrapped a chain around his bumper and a chain around my bumper, and it didn't rip the car in half, okay? <laughs> and he said to me, he said, listen, if we're going to get out of this bank, he said, all you do is put it in neutral, and you go where I go. You steer where I go. Don't touch nothing. No gas, no brakes. He said, I'll yank you out of here in a second. And so, boom, he took off. Boom, I popped out like a pimple. Coming right out of the bank. Just so you know what it's like, okay? <laughs> I popped out of the snowbank, put it in park. He got out of the truck and he came back. He backed his truck up and he began to take the chains off. And I didn't have any money. I'm just a poor kid, but, but I want to offer, right? I mean, this guy went out of his way to stop to help me. And I, and I thought, I, I got to offer him something. Maybe, I don't know. And I said, sir, what do I owe you for what you did? And he said, absolutely nothing. Never forget this lesson. He said, absolutely nothing. He said, all I want you to do is next time it might be me. And he said, it might be one of my daughters. I thought, this is getting better. I was 17, baby. <laughs> he said, just help them out. And then he got in his truck and left. I thought to myself, well, if that's God's angel, he needs to fix his attitude. But <laughs> I never forgot that. See, because where I was stuck, there was no way I was going to get out of there unless I got a little bit of help, right? Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you need somebody to come along. Andy, you might as well come. It's getting late. Maybe you need somebody to come alongside you and, and, and just bandage up your wounds. You know, it's interesting. The Bible says that he poured on oil and wine. Can I tell you, those are expensive items. And normally somebody doesn't have those on their possession unless they're, unless they're selling or buying or trading spices. He, he poured on the, the, the wine. The wine would have been acidic. It would have been fermented. It would have been, would have been like um, uh, putting, putting on like almost acid in some ways. But remember growing up as kids, our mothers used to clean out every wound we had with rubbing alcohol or peroxide, right? And it was like battery acid, an open wound. I don't think this is love, but... And then just to make things better, they'd make it better by putting red iodine on it, okay? And that would hurt worse. That's what the, red, that's what the wine would have done. It would have cleansed the wound. And then it said he poured on oil. 
This is the beautiful picture of, of what I believe Jesus wants you to see. He poured on oil. See, the oil would have softened the tissues and began the healing process. It says that he, he put him on his own donkey. Do you get the ownership? He, he had a donkey. He'd ridden there. He'd gotten there on that animal. But if he was going to walk out of here, he was going to have to, he was going to do the walking, right? He, he lifted the man up. The man had no way to get up. Are you following? This man who had fallen could not get up on his own unless somebody lifted him up. Maybe, you'd, maybe you're stuck today and you don't know how you're going to get out of where you're at. I'm here to tell you, Jesus wants to lift you up. And he wants to put you at a higher place. He rode on in here. Remember that triumphal entry when he rode in on a donkey? And he went out on a cross because you matter to him. He took him to an inn. A man that was on his way out, half dead, was taken in. He was brought to an inn, and there he was taken care of. It is the picture of our Savior, Jesus, who when he came upon humanity, and he saw our condition, that we were bleeding and we were broken, and we were half dead apart from Christ, he came to where we were. He had compassion that hurt him all the way to the bone. As he died upon a cruel cross to shed his own blood that purified the wounds of our sins, sometimes it stings. And then he poured out the oil. She and I would receive the Holy Spirit as a healing balm. He bandaged us with his mercy and with his grace. And then he lifted us up to a new place and said, I'm going to take care of you. Those of us who were on our way out, he brought in. He's taking care of us. Praise be to God that none of us have been abandoned anymore. We have been brought to a higher place. You have been redeemed. You have been rescued. You are His. I love that Jesus thought of us. Let's do this. Why don't you stand to stretch a little bit. We're going to sing this song and then I have you set back down. But can I share with you one more little nugget before I go? Verse 35, verse 35 gets me excited. The first three words of verse 35 says, the next day the next day guess what he made it the man who was down made it Samaritan says I will return I'll come back and whatever I need to reimburse you for I will you know what he was saying was I know this guy's gonna make it there is a tomorrow listen better days are ahead for you too you will make it out you think it's your worst day it's not your last day in Jesus name because there is a tomorrow hey Annie the sun will come up tomorrow. I wanted to sing it, but I know I'm not that good. We ought to applaud our God because he is always with us and help is on the way. Thank you for joining us at Westside Community Church. We hope to see you at one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m.